Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the last day of the Cascadia Poetry Festival. How is everybody holding up? Yay! All right, yes, and I think it's, you know, it's really quite something to see this many people on the Sunday morning, last day of a festival, at this hour when there have been all of these late night to midnight and beyond activities. So I'm wearing my special wake up t-shirt to kind of help you all in that process. That was the concept. My name is Kim Goldberg. I'm one of about 14 people who have been working on a committee to organize this festival for more than a year now. I'm by no means the key person. The key person would be David Fraser. Is David around? Yay, David. Okay, so he ran an errand, of course. <laughs> Anyway, but we have, uh, in addition to David, there have been at least another 13 of us that have been grinding away on this, and this, this is what it's all for. Uh, I will be your host this morning for our panel on rewilding poetry, eco-poetry in Cascadia. But before I introduce the panel and our four panelists, I have some other opening remarks. I want to let everybody know about things that are happening, and thanks that... I want to put out there. Uh, firstly, I want to acknowledge with respect that we are gathered here on the traditional territory of the Snenemoke First Nation. We've been here for this all weekend. We would also like to thank Vancouver Island University for providing this great facility for us and the VIU Faculty of Arts and Humanities for their financial assistance. Additionally, we'd like to thank the Nanaimo Tourism Development Fund, the Canada Council for the Arts, the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers' Union of Canada, and Cascadia Now for their funding as well. We've had many local business sponsors, which has just been great. They're, they're all listed in our program, which you've got uh, with your conference packages. So do us a favor and support the businesses that have supported us. David is now here. David, why don't you just stand up so everybody can give you the applause you deserve. David while, while it took many hands and feet and brains and every other body part to make this festival happen, the Committee of 14, it would not have happened without that one person, without David. Also would like to acknowledge Paul Nelson. Is Paul here this morning? Okay. Well, Paul slept in, but what the heck, he's allowed. He's the founder of the Cascadia Poetry Festival, and he and his Seattle-based crew uh, organized it and mounted it for the first two years in Seattle. That was in 2012 and 2014. Uh, we now have a, a lot of YouTube links up, so if you want to see, and photos as well. So we've been photo documenting this and video documenting the festival the whole time, and that content is now showing up on our Facebook page for Cascadia Poetry Festival and our Twitter account for Cascadia Poetry Festival. So look there for the stuff, and if you yourself are tweeting images, if you hashtag it, CPF3, Cascadia Poetry Festival 3, we will find it and retweet it. A uh, small press fair. We've been having a great small press fair that's gone all weekend long. It's still there until the end of the day. Definitely go out, have a look at those books. We've got two magazines that are free. Of course, I forgot to bring them up here with me, but uh, the Geist magazines that you see lying around in large quantities, pick them up, take them home, they're free. Same thing for BC Book World. We've got free copies of all of that. And at the end of our event, yes, there they are. Thank you very much, David. If you see those, please take them home. Otherwise, David has to take home hundreds of pounds of stuff. Uh, and at the end of today, our events end at 5, then there's, you know, some tear down. And for anybody who wants, we've got a wrap party informally happening at the Globe after that. It might be more of a wrap lie around in lounges, exhausted thing than a wrap party, but whatever it is, everybody's welcome. Come down to the Globe anytime, basically after 5, um, when the events here end. I think that's it for those announcements. So, uh, <clears throat> our, the opening panel this morning is Rewilding Poetry, Eco-Poetry in Cascadia. Our four panelists will be Rita Wong, Stephen Collis, 
Christine Leclerc, and Sharon Thiessen. You're in a different order here than you're sitting there, so that's my little brain thing happening. I will introduce each one of them momentarily in more detail, but first I just wanted to say, oh, excuse me, I'll be right back. <laughs> 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 yes, that's what I wanted to say. I just want to say a few words to kind of frame our topic this morning. <clears throat> so our four panelists will, presumably, be giving us some examples, ideas, and thoughts about the notion of rewilding poetry. Now, none of us on the organizing committee for the festival actually knows what that term means. We just invented it. We coined it for the program. So be up to our panelists to define it in whatever way they choose, and that will be an interesting discovery. Uh, the subtitle, however, of the panel is Eco Poetry in Cascadia, and the eco poetry term does in fact have more currency right now. It's also a term that is disputed, debated, and even disliked by some poets. Some say that the phrase eco poetry is a pointless and counterproductive attempt to segregate an impulse that is in fact woven through all poetry. For what is ecology if not everything on the planet? What are we writing poetry about? Others perceive the term eco-poetry as a cheap marketing and branding device because of the trendiness of eco-anything. The term eco-poetry presumably refers to poetry that is ecologically themed or ecologically aware, but then that immediately raises the question of how is eco-poetry different from what we have historically just always called nature poetry? So that to me is a very interesting question. <clears throat> Various poets have weighed in on the question of how do you distinguish eco-poetry from nature poetry? I tend to distinguish eco-poetry from nature poetry by asking myself whether the poem is situated in any kind of a larger ethical context. Is human impact on the biosphere present or implied in any way within the poem? Is there a taking of responsibility, no matter how subtle that may be? So others have different definitions of eco-poetry. Some would say that eco-poetry must foreground the natural world and nature itself, rather than the anthropocentric first-person I, observing and existing within and wandering through the natural world. But perhaps we don't need to have the discussion at all. Perhaps all we need to do is turn to Gary Snyder's essay, Some Points for a New Nature Poetics. Perhaps we can just avoid the term eco-poetry altogether. Gary Snyder may have already done the work for us. And in point form, he, his statement is, for each of these points is longer, but in point form, what Gary Snyder said, in Some Points for a New Nature Poetics, that it be literate, that it be grounded in place, that it use coyote as a totem, that it use bear as a totem, that it find further totems, that it fear not science, that it go further with science, that it study mind and language, that it be crafty and get the work done. <clears throat> so I think maybe Gary Snyder has solved the problem. <laughs> the debate about what is and isn't eco-poetry. Our first presenter today, I'll just tell you a little bit about each of our four presenters and then they will get up, have a go at the topic themselves, and then we'll have some time for audience questions afterwards. We'll be hearing from Sharon Thiessen, who is a poet, editor, and professor emerita of creative writing at University of British Columbia in Okanagan. She has published nine books of poetry, most recently, Oyama Pink Shale, The Good Bacteria, and A Pair of Scissors. She has edited two editions of the New Long Poem Anthology. She was editor of the Capilano Review and of the brilliant but short-lived multidisciplinary magazine, Lake, A Journal of Arts and Environment. So that's Rita on the far end. We'll also be hearing, I'm uh, sorry, that's Sharon. You see I'm, my brain, this is what happens last day of festival. That's Sharon on the far end. Rita on this end, who will be our second speaker, is the author, Rita Wong, of four books of poetry. 
Her newest book, Undercurrent, was launched last week. Is that correct? Awesome. Congratulations. It is a journey with water, a gift, and a warning from water. She teaches in critical and cultural studies at Emily Carr University in Vancouver and is researching the poetics of water and working toward watershed literacy. Her work investigates the relationships between contemporary poetics, social justice, ecology, and decolonization. Our third speaker will be Stephen Collis, and I guess I can't get mixed up there, the only man on the panel, has written many books of poetry, including The Commons, On the Material, and To the Barricades, as well as a collection of essays on the Occupy movement called Dispatches from the Occupation. Last year, he was sued by Kinder Morgan for taking a stand, very literally, on Burnaby Mountain against the planned pipeline expansion. Kinder Morgan cited the text of one of Stephen's poems in court as evidence of his rabble-rousing crimes. <laughs> What greater badge of honor could any poet hope for? <laughs> and our final speaker in the panel today will be Christine Leclerc. She is a Vancouver-based author and activist. She's the author of Counterfeit and Oilywood, as well as being an editor of The End Pipeline, which generated more than 7,000 kilometers of poetry written by over 100 poets in resistance to the proposed Northern Gateway Pipeline. Christine's poetry, yes. Yeah. Christine's, <laughs> Christine's poetry, fiction, and essays have appeared internationally. She's a communi communications manager by day and has been known to lead community theater at corporate headquarters and occupy oil rigs at sea. All right. So our first speaker is Sharon Thiessen. Thank you, uh, audience, and um, again uh, to everyone who was involved in organizing this uh, marvelous weekend of poetry. Um, thank you. It's it's really been interesting, and as you can tell, I've I've been thinking and unthinking and rethinking <laughs> about rewilding poetry. It's not something you know one thinks of for a day at a poetry conference, but somehow all the time in one's own work. Um, maybe you don't name it that, but it is kind of what, what you are doing. And, um, and I've heard uh, uh, a lot of wild poetry this weekend. <laughs> um, so because of the complexity of, of the title, um, I'm just going to say a few kind of very general things. By way of contributing to today's discussion about the possibilities of rewilding, or as I would prefer to say, reworlding poetry, I would like to make a few observations to start with. One is a quotation from a book published in 1986 by Andrew Ross called The Failure of Modernism. Quote, poetics can no longer be regarded as the innocent haven for wild philosophy or wild politics, which modernist poets claimed as their special privilege, but rather as a set of different and often conflicting discourses that are ideologically produced and therefore irreducible to any particular poet's vision, unquote. This describes pretty much the trajectory poet poetry went on to take for the next three decades. Few poets now write without consciousness that discourse is ideologically produced and that they themselves occupy subject positions within this world of discourse. But maybe a rewilded or reworlded poetry could find a place within contemporary poetics. It could affect readers and poets in a more intimate or limited sense, that is, where it could be the innocent haven for wild philosophy all over again, that Ross accused it of thinking it was in the first place. I've heard, uh, um, anyway, so please pardon my, my uh, 
mistakes and um, uh, discontinuities here. Uh, first of all, I feel cautious about the prefix re, implying an era of wild poetry either tamed and corralled or displaced by domesticated monocultures, such as the wild land has been, and that could, if elements of the wild ecology were reintroduced, revert to a wild condition. Versions of this dialectic, reform, counter-reform, restoration, have plagued modernity until neoliberalism vanquished them all and we are now thrown into a dark ages of ubiquitous empire. Mm -hmm. Except there are no uncolonized margins left. Mm -hmm. Everywhere is in the state of becoming a neoliberal monoculture via technology, economic blackmail or seduction, and or brute force. Our attention is drawn to the global, the planet, and cyberspace as worldlessness consumes the earth. By now, a totalism fractaled of fractaled and fracked surfaces. By the world, I mean the public world, the world we experience in common. But the idea of experiencing a world in common is itself uh, contested highly um, because it seems that such commonality could be a socially constructed fiction. We do not share a world, it seems to say, but rather there is a we that excludes others that wealth, power, and security belong to an us alone. It seems that there is little or no community left in the public sphere except a community of identities as we cling more and more to our finely parsed identities. The public world, though, I believe, has to do with the depths beneath the surfaces in which each simple, separate, uh, I would say, innocent, wild person swims. The rhythmic relationships by which one can notice that the surface is violent. The ground opened by poetry, by the world-making activity of poesis, restores us both to the world and to one another. None of this has escaped the notice of poetry. Young poets today, and I have to say, I really feel sorry for her young poets today. I don't mean that in a, um, you know, in a, in a in some kind of weird sense, but just that young poets today are faced with such a huge, slippery world of uh, of a territory which is so full of refracting and reflecting surfaces that to find language um, in that space is to uh, take on a really, really difficult job. Young poets today must write in such a vast and slippery territory, including the world vaporizing currents of both neoliberalism and a suspicion of imagination unless it is safely ensconced within indigenous methodologies. Um, the, uh, there is, I remember somebody once saying that like when it comes to skill or, or knowledge or something, um, we know that we are subjects constituted by language, blah, 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 blah. But the question of poetry or has to be how, how do we walk on this slippery world, on this slippery earth? It seems to me that poetry's de-wilding has been accelerated by top-down academic avant-gardism and its demand, similar to that of the corporations it now must service, 
for constant innovation, but with the caveat that the innovations also deploy ethical attitudes and challenges, as its evangelistic arm, the TED Talk, also does. <laughs> Avant-garde used to be scandalous. Now they are merely au courant. Um, and then I go on a bit about uh, naive uh, lyric writing that many young students would come to creative writing classes to practice, but then um, are uh, um, encouraged to think otherwise by the English department, by critical and cultural theory, which has shown that writing is contaminated both by words and by repressive rhetorical structures. Um, so by owning and rebranding as constraints former repressive rhetorical structures, and by freely borrowing the discourses of other disciplines, usually cultural and critical theory, contemporary academic poets are redefining as wildnesses poetry's traditional generic limitations, form, rhythm, rhyme, line, page, and returning it to democratic speech. Here, the way to reclaim poetry's life, to rewild it, is to pursue a playful conceptualism and urgently require critique of dominant discourse, the discourse that also excludes earth and nature except as instrumentality, is in this way accomplished. But here, but where I think the conceptual move has perhaps not quite delivered as far as rewilding poetry goes, is where it enacts <clears throat> a curation of discourse, the poem a proxy, for the decentered, voiceless, visionless subject. The poem is now without an unconscious, without depths, although its con constituent language, words and reference, are teeming with it. This is not to dismiss the thought, passion, and knowledge driving a needed reaction to a poetry increasingly enervated by the plethora of workshop verse and conventional or even fatuous magazine verse. The blindnesses and complacencies of mainstream modernist lyric poetry have been passionately decried by both poets and critics for decades now. And even very recently, Juno Diaz in a New Yorker article, <coughs> which I'm sure you've all read, criticized the unbearable whiteness of creative writing programs. Um, and then I went on to talk about succession and and how various movements in poetry are, uh, correct the excesses of previous ones, and that this is part of the constant life and rethinking and vitality of poetry. Um, so, you know, confessionalism, projective verse, Black Mountain, New York School, language, conceptualism, the neo and the post versions of that. Um, but I said, um, it's interesting that most of these movements, for us Canadian poets anyway, originate in the USA. In Canada, we can claim a lively conceptualist movement, uh, at, especially practiced at the University of Calgary by uh, writers like Christian Book, and um, uh, in um, the Lemonhound blogs, um, Sina Kara's Lyric Conceptualism Manifesto. But I would also like to make a special point uh, about the long poem as a Canadian, uh, uh, which I claim as, as a particularly Canadian uh, form um, that I think holds the most potential for it, a rewilding of poetry, if that's what is going to happen. Two minutes left, sure. Pardon? Two minutes left. Oh, <clears throat> gee. Okay, <laughs> today the turnover from solvency to decadence has been increasingly accelerated by the constant demand for innovation. Um, the term innovation is now sacrosanct. Uh, it now contains new, improved, uh, and respectable overtones. As Peter Cully wrote in a 2003 mm -hmm. blog post, the dominant culture is busy turning the radical or its images into the mainstream. It has to be the business of artists to resist the process and reinvent the images when they have been drained of their juice and pulse, what Whitman called urge, what Lenny Bruce called truth. What San Francisco poet Duncan McNaughton referred to as periodically recurring sweetness of heart uh, is maybe something to welcome as well. Sweetness of heart, he says, is what is really common to our desirous souls, the quality which overcomes all barriers in order to circulate anew the heart's creative feeling among men and women who have more than enough reason to despair. To radically expand 
the field of feeling seems to me an unintended ongoing work of any poetic practice of the wild, however it is or whatever it is. I'm very interested in the nature of poetic imagination, or as Blake had it, poetic genius, which transcends the relative merits of anybody's poem. Someone once said that even unpublished poetry has an effect on the world. Um, I would say that poetic imagination is similarly alive in an infinite number of human interactions in the vernacular, not thinking of poetry. Poetry will continue to rewild itself. We've all seen representations of rewilded humanless cities, vines hanging off the high rises, panthers draped over the defunct signage. This is not what we mean by a, re a quest to rewild poetry. I suspect a rewilded poetry, one that speaks to us directly and openly, despite interiority of vision, distance, time, difference of body, space, formal peculiarity. There is presence and a presence unavoidable complexity of the poet's sense of reality. And I'm going to go right down to hurry and say, as a reader or a listener, I have often enough had a feeling of my life being made more vivid and real by hearing or reading a particular poem. I feel, quite literally, that I can, go, I can now I can go on. These are poems that, as Gary Snyder says, linger in the mind and the body, I would say, and are part of the gift exchange that uh, has turned out to be the ethos and spirit of this festival. Um, this is the magic, the wildness, the innocence, the ecology of poetry, which is to say, of poetic imagination. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, Sharon. That was Sharon Thiessen we were hearing from. Next, we will uh, hear from Rita Wong. Rita has a slideshow, so we are going, the panelists are going to take their seats and enjoy the show like the rest of you. Thank you, uh, Ken and Sharon and fellow panelists. And I'd also like to thank the Snanamo uh, First Nations people who is the territory we're on. Um, I. I'm not going to talk about rewilding poetry, or, I, or maybe what I'll do is I'd like to reframe it a little bit as, as decolonizing poetry. I'm not that comfortable having some people be wild and some people not. I, I think we're all in this very complex, mixed, colonized, uh, and neoliberal moment. Um, so I want to think about, I want to go back to the question that you asked, or you, in, in quoting Gary Snyder, can, uh, to get the work done, right? And, and for me, it's like, what's the work, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you a little bit of some of the work I've been doing. Uh, and I, I think it gets at the things that we're talking about, but it, maybe from a slightly different angle. Um, uh, so I live in Vancouver on unceded Coast Salish territories, and um, it puts you in a sort of a weird place every now and then, and most of the time. But what I'll maybe say is, uh, I've been, my project lately has been to imagine the place that I'm living in through the lens of water, to, to learn um, and uh, maybe perceive through uh, water syntax, to learn to, uh, what it means to love the water. And it's very slippery work. It's, it's very, uh, uh, you know, no pun intended. Um, uh, and I think I started with this idea that, oh, we have to take care of the water, we're polluting the water, you know, that this is a serious problem, and, and it is. But I think we need to take care of ourselves, and if we take care of ourselves, uh, the water can take care of itself, too. So, not to say that we don't need to care for the water, but we are water. Um, our bodies are roughly two-thirds water, and it's easy to forget. But when we start tracing the, the relationships that exist because of the flows of water, um, you will quickly realize that you're related to the watershed that you're drinking. So we're drinking the Nanaimo River here, um, and we're giving back to the Nanaimo River in terms of sewage, and uh, I was looking at, you know, it looks like there's primary treatment here, but not secondary yet. And, and just kind of, you know, thinking about there's a limited amount of water, it keeps circulating, and there are relationships that exist because of that. Um, and I, I realize this is very obvious for some of you, but for somebody who grew up in the city and, and grew up specifically in the city of Calgary, disconnected and not knowing I was drinking the Bow River for 20 years or whatever it was, like it's, it's important to say those things and to and to do the obvious things sometimes maybe. 
So uh, the work has been, for me, uh, not just writing about it, but taking the time to educate myself about the watershed. So I'm drinking the Capilano watershed, or the Seymour watershed in Vancouver. Uh, there are five wastewater treatment plants, um, and uh, we're not doing a very good job in, in that department either. Uh, a lot of the sewage that goes out into the water is making it unhabitable for fish. Um, the more you start to re learn and research into it, the more distressing it gets in terms of the effects on our non-human or our um, animal and plant creature uh, fellow beings out there. So the work then is maybe to uh, learn about the watershed and to become worthy uh, as guests or as relatives. This is a, an image by Marika Swan who lives uh, out near Nanaimo. She's an amazing First Nations artist out there. And I think um, the work is not to appropriate First Nations cultural knowledges at all. The work is to be better allies, to be better guests, to own our own histories, uh, as fraught and as broken as they may be as migrants or as colonizers or as settlers or as unsettlers. Um, so I, I take heart from Trinity Minha's idea that we can speak nearby or speak with but not speak for others, um, and that it's important to uh, be respectful. And there's a moment um, where I was talking to Arthur Manuel, uh, a very um, amazing uh, leader uh, in, I think from the Okanagan, and he was saying that uh, Aboriginal title is actually a burden on crown title is, is how it's seen in law, but it's actually the other way around, that crown title is the burden on Aboriginal title. Yeah, yeah. And when we understand that, right, there's a whole lot of work that has to come from that. Um, as people who've uh, benefited unintentionally or, or sometimes not benefited, because I would argue that colonization has actually dehumanized and, and kind of really eaten away at, at what it means to be human um, and what it means to be in relationship. And so the work of decolonizing poetry is to spend time out on the land to learn what is, what the, what is under our feet. In, in this case, uh, all these lost streams, right, mm -hmm. that are buried into sewers. Mm -hmm. uh, all those red streams no longer exist. Well, they do exist, they're underground in pipes, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, we can't see them, we can hear them, like they're all over the place. You can hear them at the manhole covers. Um, there's, there's Musqueam Creek, which I'll talk about in a second, that still exists. But salmon, somehow the wild salmon still return into Metro Vancouver, right? Despite all the obstacles and the pollution we put in their way. And, and that in itself is a pretty amazing thing. Um, so, so the work is pretty uh, depressing sometimes, but I also take heart from the work that has been inspiring, like the, the work that has been done to save Vancouver's last uh, wild salmon stream. And I, I would say it's fighting for its life. You know, it's, um, there's a lot we can do, hopefully, to help that. Um, and I live in a neighborhood where there's a little buried stream called, uh, a lot, that runs along a street called St. George Street, um, St. George Creek. Uh, but the Musqueam name for that creek is Testatlu. Um, in Hakaminam, that would be the word for creek. And it's a tiny little creek that's buried into a sewer, uh, but it connects from like Kingsway down to the Great Northern Way, and it connects a lot of schools. Um, so I'm, I'm working in my neighborhood to try to figure out what it would mean to build a relationship through that uh, shared watershed. So we have street parties, we have parades, uh, we have community design workshops, um, and you know, the writing comes along with that or after that, but it's, it's part of the work of building relationship. Um, so I, I think it's important to think locally, and I, I think it's important to do work locally, but I also think it's important to think about the bigger picture, because we're in this globalized neoliberal moment. And this is a map that used to be free through the government of Canada. Uh, it might be hard to find now, given all the cuts that have happened. Um, but uh, what it shows you is basically how we're linked through water. So instead of provinces, I see basically uh, watersheds that are connected to the Pacific Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, Hudson's Bay, the Atlantic Ocean, and that brown mass at the bottom down to the Gulf of Mexico. So that's the watershed, basically. <laughs> the big watershed. Um, and there's lots of little watersheds embedded within that. And I was speaking at the um, 
Enbridge Joint Review panel a few years ago, and that was a depressing thing to go through. But interestingly enough, of the three panelists, I ran into one of them in the uh, elevator afterwards, and he was saying how that map, which I showed to them and explained why it's important to protect our watershed, as if that wasn't obvious already. Um, but he said that that map also looks very similar. There's some differences, but it's quite similar to the map of the treaties. Uh, yes in uh, North America, or up in the uh, north part of Turtle Island, and that makes sense because water, the flow of water, would have been something that people would have been very conscious of and, and paid attention to in terms of defining borders. Um, and so he was saying that, uh, you know, th that that was something that uh, maybe is worth thinking about. And so I, I would agree uh, that the natural, like, what, what our political systems do or what our cultural systems do could do a way better job of actually taking into account what's materially there underneath our feet and how the flow of water uh, defines or, or shapes our relationships. Um, and part of the work of, of learning from and with water, uh, learning the syntax of water, which I'm still learning and I think I'll spend my whole life learning, um, is, was to not just spend time with the buried creeks in Vancouver, but to also visit the Fraser River. And you know, I'm not an outdoorsy type. I would just die in the wilderness if you left me out there. I wouldn't survive. That's fun. Um, but I think it's still important to try to learn what you can. And, and so this is an image from Rearguard Falls. It's the upper limit of the salmon migration. And uh, Christine and I actually made this trip uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and that's the Fraser River at the headwaters. It looks very different by the time it gets down to Vancouver. It's all brown and silty. and it's been quite polluted and stuff. Um, but that's me and Christine going up to fairly close to the headwaters of the Fraser. Not, not quite the headwaters, but a little below. And but they, that area is called uh, Fraser Crossing. And what we found at Fraser Crossing, unfortunately, was this sign, oh, no. right? Oh. So there's already a petroleum pipeline crossing fairly close to those salmon uh, grounds, of uh, those salmon spawning grounds in that river. And so what I learned from that trip from the river, and you know, I don't speak river, but I'm learning. And what I learned from the river was basically that it's in danger from oil and, and from pipelines. So um, I had started this journey partly because of the invitation of Dorothy Christian, who's a very dear friend of mine. Um, from the Shipokmak and Okanagan nations, and, and she had asked two questions. One was, can you love the land like I do? And the other question that she posed was to protect our sacred, uh, to protect our sacred waters. So she had asked me at that time to get some Asian folks out to this event that she was organizing. None of them showed up, unfortunately, and then I felt that I had this responsibility, and, and this, I think, gift, actually, this, to respond to her call to protect water. So I, I started figuring, well, what can I do? You know, um, I can learn about it myself. I can teach it to other people or share what I learn is a better way to put it, maybe. Um, I developed a course around water. And so, you have two minutes. okay, great. And so, you know, we know there's a lot of dangers posed by oil. Uh, this is Lubicon Cree land that's been de devastated by oil spills. Uh, the map of the oil sands. And so what Christine and I went on was a healing walk for the tar sands. And that healing walk has been happening for, it has happened five times uh, for five years, and it will stop um, and morph into something else this year. So the work of trying to organize healing, uh, it might seem very symbolic, but it's also really important to do in ground zero of the tar sands. And to support the people in the middle of the tar sands that are doing this work, it's really hard work to organize in Alberta. And I, I come from somebody, I come from a place where it was impossible to talk about oil growing up in Calgary. Right? It was having to leave it and having enough space from it and see other people talk about it that gave me the courage um, to even say some of the things that I'm saying to you guys today. So the walk is, is an emphasis on ceremony, on healing, on what needs to be done. Um, and I think the walk is in concert with a lot of other groups out there, like the Unistoten camp that is blocking a bazillion pipelines and, and doing really amazing work. I just want to acknowledge the work that is being done out there on the land. Um, and part of this work is to somehow figure out what to do to this colonial situation where all this protection, so-called protection of uh, 
of water has been destroyed, right? So the Udas don't talk about responsibilities to land rather than rights, because rights are man-made and, and you know, they can be sort of taken away and, and sort of redefined by governments, but responsibilities exist regardless of whether or not your governments uh, heed them or not. And uh, I'm just going to skip over. So maybe the last thing I'll say is uh, the work is to think, for me, not just about the Pacific Ocean watershed, but also the Arctic Ocean watershed. There's a group up north called the Keepers of the Water that have been doing some amazing work. And I think when we're thinking about um, bioregional work like Cascadia, which is awesome to see, it's very grounded. But I think it's also important to think about the relationships between different bioregions and, and to try to make those links as well. Um, so what are we part of and, and what are we giving back is, is, is I think, the work of, of trying to decolonize poetry um, and to become better guests and relatives uh, wherever we happen to be living. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. That was great, really inspiring. That was Rita Wong we were hearing from. I'm really glad you mentioned the Unistoten camp. I've just been astounded by what's going on there. It's so remote, but yet there are. there's been a lot of support from allies as well because there's caravans for Camp Gunastoten that, that leave uh, periodically from Vancouver and Victoria, carrying allies up who go and stay for a while, or even live, stay for weeks at a time, and help with all of the building, the creation, and maintenance of the camp. Uh, our next, our third speaker is Stephen Collis. Thank you. Um, uh, I just want to also acknowledge that the uh, Stinnewood people and uh, the unceded territory we're on. Um, I've got Peter Culley in my mind too, who I've been here for years and uh, been thinking about him walking up the hill through the Nanaimo across the railroad tracks today. Um, and also, just you know, I, I, Rita and I and Christine too are often thinking along the same lines. So um, Rita pretty much said everything. I would like to say it said it better. Um, so I'll, I'll think of a couple of things I can say that on to that. I'm sure Christine is going to be facing the same problem, which is we're all, we're all thinking the same way these days, which is a good thing. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about rewilding. And the first thing I want to talk about is um, a negative uh, version of rewilding. And that's the fact that um, well, a recent uh, study came out, was published in Nature magazine just maybe a week ago or so, uh, attempting again to think of uh, the dating of the Anthropocene, the, the geological, geophysical age we are uh, perhaps now in the midst of, uh, an era in which human activity has come to impact and affect the entire planet geophysically. Um, and that, that new narrative about when we should date um, the Anthropocene from uh, is based on an, uh, an example, a bad example, of rewilding. And that is, uh, this study suggests that um, attempts to uh, link or date the Anthropocene to uh, the Industrial Revolution and uh, the burgeoning of um, our dependence on fossil fuels is a little hard to pin down as, as, a, as to, to a particular point. Um, they also suggest uh, that uh, nuclear radiation uh, human beings have unleashed into the atmosphere. Another point that some people, um, some scientists have, have suggested is where we should date the Anthropocene from uh, is, all, is just simply too recent because we're talking about the 1960s or so when it really starts showing up everywhere in the planet um, because of, primarily because of atmospheric um, testing in the Pacific Ocean, say. Uh, so this study suggests that the, uh, the appropriate date is 1610. And 1610 is the bottom a point of a century or a century and a half long dip in planetary CO2. Um, so from uh, the end of the, uh, what would you say, end of the 15th century through on and well into the, the 17th century, there was a, a dip in CO2 in planet, a very large, noticeable, recorded worldwide uh, dip in CO2. Um, what caused that dip in CO2? This study suggesting, well, uh, reforestation is uh, a very rapid and extensive reforestation in the Americas because the people in the Americas post contact with Europeans disappeared and all the land that they had been farming was reforested very rapidly in a number of decades and that expansion of forests became a, a massive new carbon sink and took carbon out of the atmosphere. 
Uh, now, this study um, develops a calculus where they say, okay, uh, how much land would each individual have been farming? Uh, how much reforested land are we talking about uh, that is registered as soaking up carbon in the, the uh, Arctic um, uh, ice cores they're drilling out? Uh, and then they can, by this crazy math, suggest how many uh, indigenous people in North America uh, died in the 100 years after contact. And their, their study suggests about 50 million people. Uh, and you know, these kind of numbers, how many uh, indigenous people directly and indirectly were killed uh, via colonization. Uh, numbers in the millions have been bandied about for a long time now. But this scientific study suggests by looking at the change in atmospheric carbon, and what that implies through the reforestation of former farmed land suggests 50 million people in America has died. Uh, I guess between 1492 and 1610 or so. So there's a very, um, if, if that's uh, a rewilding, uh, that's a pretty nasty um, rewilding. Um, and what it suggests to me is, is that this thing, whatever this thing is, and this, take Kim's point, maybe we don't really know what we're talking about um, when we use this word rewilding, but I'm, I'm going to speculate and, and, and talk through my ignorance at this point. Um, that if we're, if we're, and one thing we're after right now in the face of the Anthropocene, a term I don't like, and I'll say something more about in a second, um, it is a need to, to rewild. What we're talking about is to, to build a different, uh, more just uh, relationship to the natural world. And just in a sense of just to everyone who depends upon um, the natural world, but just also, if we can talk in these kind of terms, to uh, the non-human, just to environments and ecosystems, to water and, and watersheds, as Rita was just um, talking about too. How, how do we end? Because I think this is part of the problem. Uh, if we think uh, there's something we can actually do about the changes we've unleashed uh, through climate change, uh, what that is that we do the work we need to take on um, has to be based on a sense of justice. And, and we can't rewild simply by, by stopping being human uh, and somehow, um, I don't know, taking off our clothes and <laughs> running into the water and forest and, and yawping and, 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 and reconnect that way, although that's good to do once in a while. Um, <laughs> we, 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 if, if we're going to do something about this, it's still going to be a human project. Uh, that is, it's going to be organized through uh, inherently and sometimes problematically anthropocentric concepts, even if those, those concepts are concepts of responsibility or stewardship, um, justice, etc., uh, we're not going to do without those concepts. And it's still going to be a political project, even if it's uh, quote a rewilding. Um, so one term I, I, I kick around sometimes uh, is that we need to conceive of the rise of a bioterriot. Uh, there are still political concepts in the past that we uh, are useful tools still, and some of them come through uh, the Marxist tradition. And Marxism was based on this idea that there is a repressed class in the, in, in, that has evolved over time, the proletariat, and as they come to consciousness, uh, they need to take over the means of production, and we will arrive at a more just, uh, fair, and equitable, uh, equitable society. Well, I think right now that the, uh, the oppressed class in the world and, and the class uh, through which um, capital is uh, unequally accumulated and extracted is all of life itself. It's not a portion of human beings, although it still remains that, but it's also every animal on this planet is being used as a source of uh, the generation of capital. Every ecosystem, every waterway, the atmosphere, uh, the minerals in the earth, everything now is the source of the generation of uh, wealth uh, and, and is exploited and repressed. So if we are going to um, rewild, uh, which I would agree with Rita, is also a process of decolonizing um, or re-indigenizing, if that's a, a term or a concept we can even think of, I might say something about that. Does that sound good? Okay. Uh, <laughs> what was I just saying? <laughs> That was the middle of the sentence that this suddenly disappeared in the calendar. That sentence was going. <laughs> Decolonizing, rewilding. Yes, if we're going to do those things, um, then we have to think in a new way. Uh, we can't get outside the anthros, as I was saying a minute ago, but we need to find ways 
of thinking solidarity, thinking that we are organizing on a cooperative basis with things that aren't human. It can't simply be a human project, even though we're going to rely on those, those human tools we have. It has to be on the basis of uh, affinities and solidarities with animals, with water, with ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, in my, my grandparents were born in England. If I go to England, am I indigenous there? Now, I think that's kind of an offensive you know, concept. I don't think that's true. But uh, it does make me think a little bit more about, okay, what do we mean when we say indigenous? Because there are indigenous people all over this planet. Uh, so what we're, I think, I'm just jumping down really quickly, and I have no idea if this is um, a useful definition at all. But here's the definition I was jumping down, I think, at some point here, maybe what Kim was introducing us. That, it, that indigeneity is a long-term, multi-generational inhabitants of place, based in cultural practices geared towards a sustainable, interdependent relationship to, to the natural environment. But when we talk about indigenous people from this planet, that's kind of what we're talking about. That they have these cultural practices that are based on a, a, a lived relationship to a natural place. Can I uh, that again? Yeah. Oh, sure, okay. So indigeneity is a long-term, multi-generational inhabitants of a place based in cultural practices geared towards a sustainable, interdependent relationship to the natural world. That is exactly what European people have not had for a long time. That's exactly what um, the evolution of colonization and capitalism over the last 400 years, the era the scientists are beginning to call the Anthropocene, this, year, this era, maybe since 1610. That's exactly what that's not. That's not a, a connection to place in a sustainable way. Uh, that's the exploitation of, of the opposite of that, and that's an assault on indigeneity, uh, the planet over. So I think to do anything about this, um, yeah, we have to decolonize, we have to re-indigenize, but that also has to be, uh, I think, inherently uh, um, an anti-capitalist kind of project. Uh, because that's, so, to the Anthropocene, how am I doing time-wise? Um, Who knows? Yeah, I think I've got two, two minutes. Two or three, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when in time, two minutes. So the Anthropocene, uh, obviously part of the problem, and you hear this in articles that are starting to write about popular uh, journals about it, says, oh yeah, the Anthropocene, we're all to blame for this. We're not all to blame for this, and that's part of the problem with a term like the Anthropocene, because uh, there's a very small pe group of people that are, that are really to blame for this. Another very large group of people went along with it because it was convenient, or they didn't feel like they had a choice, or they got sold a bill of goods, or they got hooked in, or bought off, or however you want to call it. But I'm not ready to blame the um, campesinos of Latin America, or the people of Africa, or much of Asia for the Anthropocene. They didn't do it. <laughs> um, so I, I prefer to speak of an era of geological capitalism or geophysical capitalism as the era that we're now in. Now, really quickly, I haven't talked about poetry. And uh, here we go. So um, I, I, where are our poetic models? Because um, I think this, the, the imagination, I think Sharon was saying, where is the imagination of our solidarity with the natural world? And I think we've been, I've been hearing moments of it this weekend, even just to give one example. Um, uh, Sam Hamill's, uh, what I would call an, er an erotics of place in some of his poetry last night, yeah. is, is a wonderful way of, of expressing a kind of affinity and solidarity with the natural world. But here's another one from Rita Wong's recent book she was just mentioning. Here it is, just out in a week ago or so, uh, from a poem called J28. I'm just going to read a passage and I'll end with this and near the end of that poem. It is Gandhi we need to align ourselves with. Gandhi and Gaia and Vandana and Maud and Marbled and mycorrhizal mats. Winona and Ward and Jaggy and Arundhati and phytoplankton and peregrine falcons. Naomi and Orin and Togastai and Je Jeanette and Lee and bitter melon and bees. Percy and Shiv and Jack and Elizabeth and chrysanthemum greens and canola now radiated. Yoko and Yes Men and Christos and Dion and dolphins and prairie dogs. Teresa and Melina and Pamela and Rosa Parks and salmon and cedar. Wab and Harsha and Clayton and Ariel and eider ducks and water bears. Thank you.
you very much, Stephen. That was Stephen Collis, and our final speaker today is Christine Leclerc. Then we'll have an opportunity for audience involvement and discussion. Thanks for the introduction, Kim, and thanks uh, to my fellow panelists for all you've shared so far. Um, Hopefully I'm not actually the last speaker today because I know we'll all have some great things to discuss momentarily. Um, I, um, I'm going to uh, share some thoughts uh, related to the idea of wilderness and um, grounding through um, a poem called Oily Wood that I um, worked on some years ago. Um, so here we go. Um, on Friday, I, I read from Oily Wood, and, um, and so I'm using it as a starting point uh, just because poetry is such a way that, um, for me, I'm able to ground into ideas about what is going on in our world and, um, and how I can bring that together with how I'm, I'm feeling. So um, hearing the speakers just now, I, um, I probably don't have to hold this mic, but it's somehow... I'll just leave it alone. Um, uh, it's, it's brought up a lot of emotion. I, I've noticed that my heart has been pounding really hard, and not just because I was about to speak, but because actually uh, the things that are being discussed are, are quite perhaps apocalyptic in nature or scale um, because the issues are so important um, for not just our survival, but the survival of many species, of course, and, and also the function of the ecosystems, and et cetera. Um, but returning to, to this um, poem, I uh, created it in 2012, and uh, it was created mostly during the summer of that year. Um, the work kicked off at a writer's residence with Antioch College's Global Seminar on Energy. And uh, while I was in Ohio, I, I met several sound artists, um, artists who were passionate about recording uh, the sounds of their uh, bioregions. And, um, they convinced me that in, in working on a poem about uh, the inlet where I lived and, and some of the, um, the I mean, there's lots of tanker traffic in Bird Inlet, so it's not just tar sands tankers that are going through. Obviously, there's, there's lots of different products um, uh, that, are, that are going through those waters. Um, uh, but in particular, that, that uh, that product has been of interest to me uh, because of the scale of the extraction that is happening in Alberta and and the um, the trend that it, it just steps into um, in terms of the pollution uh, that is happening in our world and um, and anyway these these artists were telling me about um, their own hikes in the woods near where they lived and the sounds that they were discovering, sounds that they never knew were there until they really listened, perhaps with their eyes closed, perhaps for hours, um, perhaps with others. And, um, and anyway, they obviously made an impression on me. So when I got back to Vancouver, I started um, going around the inlet not only to talk about uh, the beach with, with people who were there, but to actually just record it. Um, and um, I'll just play a little bit of sound from that for you so you can get an idea of what I was hearing when I was going around and doing that. I'll have to rely on the interwebs here, so let's see how that goes. It was it was a really pleasurable. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, it was a really pleasurable experience, of course, going around um, to all these beaches, listening to all different kinds of water, um, putting the microphone sometimes in the, in the waves itself. Actually, that, that made me more friends than anything else. I had a, a microphone that I adapted for underwater recording, and people were wondering what I was doing and wanted to see if they could try to. And um, anyway, so it was nice to make friends that way. But um, one sound that I, I wasn't anticipating at all, there were many that I didn't anticipate, but one I didn't anticipate hearing so prominently in the recordings was uh, the sound of float planes, because of course, uh, just as we have in Nanaimo, um, there's a Harbor Air uh, Airport uh, right in Burrard Inlet, and those planes are coming from all directions, and uh, so no matter what beach I was at, <laughs> I seemed to be uh, getting a lot of uh, float plane sound everywhere. And um, I guess in, um, well, I was in Ohio, um, one of the artists I met, her name's Sarah Buckingham, and um, she was telling me about how there are, at the time, so this was several years ago, fewer than 10 places in the world you could actually go and um, record sound that didn't um, result in any other um, human-generated um, sounds um, making their way into the recording. So, you know, whether it's machines or, or actually people's voices um, or uh, other types of human-made human, human -made sounds, there, there are very, very few places in the world where you can actually do that. Um, so I, um, I guess I, I asked myself if sound were a measure of wilderness, could we say that there was any wilderness left? Um, and I suppose you could take that question to optics, you know, given that our entire world is mapped by, you know, however many satellites, etc. Visually, is there any wilderness left? And, and you could go through it. And of course, we have just our limited human senses to, to go about these things um, with. So, um, I guess, interestingly, the word um, wilderness emerged uh, from, in my mind as, as one that I, that I had a lot of trouble latching onto. Um, and, you know, of course, I was looking it up and et cetera, trying to see whereabouts this word um, came from and um, could find that uh, there were some early instances of it in, in the 1200s. And um, the way it was uh, understood at the time, or at least through our you know, modern English translations of the Old English, was an uncultivated uh, land, so in relation to the practice of agriculture, from what I can tell, and uh, one where wild animals in particular live. Um, so, I wondered also if our past cultural influencers would have applied the term wilderness to our vast, uncultivated, urbanized, and industrialized landscapes. Um, and, sorry. I just, um, I also got to thinking a lot about the uh, ocean, because I was recording the ocean. And, um, and how perhaps the word wilderness didn't actually apply to the ocean as it was originally conceived, um, since it has more of a, a contrast to, to agriculture and to creatures of the land um, and its initial uses. Um, and, um, but nonetheless, the, the word uh, wilderness or, or wild has come to um, be associated with the ocean. And um, one example of that I, I found actually when I arrived here in Nanaimo just the other day, uh, I passed by the Georgia Strait Alliance offices, which you may have seen too if you're staying at the Painted Turtle or anywhere close by. And um, in their window, they have a sign that says, um, wild salmon, don't do drugs. So. I love that sign, <laughs> but, um, but just a, uh, an example of how uh, the salmon is being considered a, a, wild, a wild animal, and so therefore the ocean must be a, a wild place. Um, if, if I um, move forward with that, um, you know, I think of, uh, from, from what I've been gleaning and familiarizing myself with um, in preparation for, for um, this conference or this festival, um, seeing wild as also being um, defined as untamed or undomesticated, so that relationship to civilization or um, kind of social practices of um, uh, normalizing certain behaviors and et cetera. Um, and, and Kim talked about uh, eco-poetics, though uh, can be a contentious term, also relating to uh, and the sense of an ethics, um, so not just observing uh, 
a beautiful thing in nature, which I clearly did when I was recording all these uh, water sounds. Um, and so I think that um, while well, ethics is obviously such a broad-ranging field, um, and I'm sure we'll go into uh, many interesting directions momentarily um, with that type of discussion, um, I think using the word wild invites us to consider our relationship to wilderness and um, we're defining it in terms of tameness and tameability, um, whether that's the, the, right, the right thing to do. So anyway, I just, I just think it, it sets up a really uncomfortable um, dichotomy um, between humans and animals and other life forms. And um, I won't say that working on uh, the Oily Wood poem gave me a magic answer um, to, to that, or a magic window into another way of seeing things. But I did notice that listening to the waters, just taking the time to, to do that in a way that I hadn't actually done before, um, was very humbling um, because so much of it was um, undecipherable and um, untranslatable for me. So um, while it was an opening experience, it was also uh, one in which I had to acknowledge uh, that I, I was very limited in my ability to actually um, interpret other than appreciate and, and, and um, have a patience with being present to perhaps listen more. So thank you. Christine. That was Christine Leclerc who is speaking. Thank you so much, Christine, for playing the audio recording of the ocean. You know, we've had words all weekend. We've had great and inspiring words. I've thought so much and felt so much, but in just the seconds that you were playing that, I just went to such a, a deep place in my body. I mean, it's like we, we need to use all the sensory modalities. And that certainly got us there. And Sharon, right away next to me, said, it sounds like a pulse, it's like a heartbeat. You know, and it did. You just, I mean, we're just instantly alive. We're instantly brought back into our bodies when we hear a sound in nature. So you've been listening to our four panelists, Rita Wong, Stephen Collis, Christine Leclerc, and Sharon Thiessen. We are in this oops, room for another 20 minutes, so let's just go straight to the audience for questions and comments. Um, uh, I'm going to start with all together, Lisa. <laughs> um, okay, first of all, I congratulate you for, for being as active as you are and, and, and upholding your beliefs and, and using your words to support that. But my question back to you is when I look at this, if I were to take a photograph, and I were to circle, for example, if we look at the whole question of petrochemicals. Yeah, they're on your feet. They're probably in your underwear, glasses. You're on, you're on, you're on your, you know, sitting on them in front of you, the hand you hold in your hand. And so, my problem is, and what I think we need to explore more than just here's the wild and what the wild is, but here is us, and here we are living the dichotomy. And how are we living that dichotomy that perpetuates the need? for petroleum pipelines, for, for everything. Um, you know, it's like, I was thinking today, you know, we, we, we talk about the cure for cancer. Well, in some regards, we know what causes cancer. And what we're really looking for is not necessarily a cure for cancer, but an excuse to continue on with the production of the way of life that we're doing. And so that's, I don't know if you've, have you explored that aspect, you know, living in the dichotomy. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for raising that. Um, and I think that comes up a lot. Like if you say you went up to the tar sands for the healing, while well, people will be like, how'd you get there, right? Like you drove, you knew, right? And I, I think it's important to say we're trapped in a system or we're complicit in a system or we didn't choose to be complicit, but we're, we're stuck in it. But that doesn't mean you can't critique that system and say you need to change the system and, and move to a different one. Like Alberta has a lot of solar, or, or sorry, it doesn't have a lot of solar. It does actually have a, a fair amount of wind, but it has the ability or the potential, I should say, to shift, right? So, I mean, I can individually bike around and meanwhile I just make more space for people to drive on the road and pollute. Like I, I realize that on some level. But on the other level, you need like 
people need to say we need a different system. We need one that's more renewable, and, and there are options, and we need to really be doing that on a systemic level. So I, I spent a lot of time beating myself up for whatever, and I, I felt that that's not really the best use of my time and energy in terms of the long term or the multi-generational ge perspective on this. So um, I think, yes, we're caught in the system, and it's not perfect, and it's messed up. But we also can see that something needs to move and shift, and, and it's putting energy into that, right, that, that I think is important. But I'm glad you raised that, because it, it does come up, and it's on my mind a lot, too, right? I'm always kind of waiting, should I go, should I not go? Like, you know, um, is it worth it? And at the end of the day, I don't know if it's worth it, but you have to try. David had his hand up from the very beginning, McCloskey. Uh, did you have a comment, David? Well, I wanted to thank you all, I and mean, Kim especially, for organizing this. Mm -hmm. one hit themes. Um, just two quick comments, which are brief comments, which are really invitations. Um, you're transported when those sounds are played. Kim was right on. And the snippet is just... Uh, it takes you to another space, no, no, not another space, it takes you back to the primary world. Mm -hmm. So the invitation is, we ended up in, in the hallway at, at the second one in, in Seattle, listening to wolf sounds. The invitation is, for 2017, for the Bioregional Gathering, let's fill the hall with sounds. Yeah. That sounds the voices of the, mm -hmm. of the place and the, and the first peoples here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the second, oh, oh, and the other one is just on, on the sounds is, if we had that shift in perception from uh, privileging sight and the poet in that, uh, seeing an image and then writing about the thought object in their heads, look at how fast we got right into the waters in the Wednesday. So let's shift from sight, privileging sight, distant sense to, to sound. The other one is a very simple one about ecology. Sometimes we're making this more complex than it need be. Um, ecology is not just a, a word about a science or recycling. It is how the world is fundamentally organized. So it's how the world is woven together. That's, that's on all levels in depth through time. So an eco-poetics is how the world is woven together. So the invitation is simply join the weave and then and let it sink through you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, Shay. I want to thank you all so much. And um, also the sound, Christine, brought tears to my eyes. It's really intense. Um, the thing that I'm concerned with and interested in, and I think Rita's work um, that she shared today gets to this, is um, rewilding ourselves and rewilding our cities, like where we are. Mm -hmm. And um, I live in a city, and for me, it's a privilege to even gain access to nature, Absolutely. as this idea of pristine nature. Um, but the, like, how do we rewild our poetics and ourselves in this city <coughs> and, and claim those spaces, like permaculture practices, working with what's there and cultivating our connection to the land. Like, that was incredible showing the creeks that are now in the pipes and thinking, of, thinking about that. Yeah. So I know that some of you maybe <coughs> all live in cities. Like how, like, how do we do this where we are, you know, instead of this, like, well, we have to, like, go out and do this out there instead of, like, what about in here? What about where we are? Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Any of you want to... Take it if you want. Sure. Um, well, the work in terms of trying to daylight the creeks is, is one small example of that for me, anyway. Um, I think, uh, you know, not everybody, as you say, can get out of the city, but within the city, you know, trying to work within, say, the city bureaucracy or parks or transportation, like, like the whole sort of, it is a colonial structure that kind of keeps everything running like a machine, but it also uh, is possible or hopefully possible to intervene in it somehow or to, or to, to reorganize it. So that work is very hard, but I, I think like people foraging in the city, for example, for, for you know, weeds or but that are actually medicines, like C. Spice has done some amazing work in that regard. Um, I, I think, you know, we have to look at wherever we are and, and work with that 
Um, so I, I like the question. I don't have a simple answer to it, but I think it's through like paying attention to what grows without you planting it in mm -hmm. the city, for instance, or uh, what happens with the water, as I, I've already talked about. Um, you know, animals that go feral, I think, is the other thing that's really interesting, um, depending on what area you're in. Or, or that manage to somehow hide, or not hijack, piggyback with people, like crows or rabbits. coyotes, raccoons, etc. Rabbits. Yeah, rabbits. Yeah. They, they're kind of delicious, but I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Picture Rita walking up hill and going, Look at that delicious rabbit. <laughs> 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 no, but that's a great point. I think um, Rita's project and that, that the mapping I can play at, and, the, and going to the schools along the, the creek route that's hidden, th those kind of things are amazing and, and fundamental. So yeah, drawing attention to that awareness around, um, and also the I, I've written a lot and thought a lot about blackberry picking in an urban environment because Vancouver and every place on, in Cascadia is riddled with these actually invasive uh, Himalayan blackberries, but they're abundant and. They're free and they're just growing on their own and they taste really good and make great pies and, and jam which you can share with people and it, it's a way of sort of consciously and, and bodily and, and in a community way re-engaging with this, what's growing, you know, beside the dumpsters at Safeway, you know, those are probably the best ones, but, um, <laughs> you know what I mean, it's everywhere. And also think just, in, you know, it's another model of having to go somewhere, but I live in Tuasson outside of Vancouver and I go to Vancouver to protest. <laughs> so for, to work too, but also it's, it's a, it, doesn't, it seems a disconnect for where, where you're living. And yet, um, a couple years ago, a, a little teeny, a pretty haired church group came to me and they wanted Ray to do a. Fine. I know the hair's good. It's good. <laughs> I don't know here. But I just, you know, just to get clear that the demographic here, you know, living in the suburbs, and said, you know, we, we really want, we're worried about what's happening at Roberts Bank, and the Department of Vancouver wants to do this remediation thing, which is really bullshit what they're trying to do. Um, they actually call it habitat banking, where they fix something up, and they put that in the bank so they can screw stuff up over here. And literally, that's the model they, they would work on. Um, and they wanted to, so it was, suddenly we were organizing a blockade, you know, in the suburbs. Uh, it was awesome. Um, anyway. One last one. Well, we this mic, actually. We should, we should. Oh, that's this one. Okay. Um, yes, well, um, um, somebody, uh, we, I guess it was you, talking about, you know, how do we uh, reconcile ourselves to these um, contradictions and, and discomforts? Not, Not reconcile so much reconcile, ourselves. It's no. more like rewilding, rewilding ourselves also, like including our mentality. Yeah. And I would state. say including our suffering yeah. about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And and this and and you know, I'm not um, uh, an activist poet in that sense, but I do think that poetry to get to Christine's work as well is the sound of imagination in language. And that it too is an ecology. It, it too is not always in our control. Mm -hmm. And um, and to go back to the the business of sound um, by ear, you know, by sound, we navigate our language poetically, and also we need, I think, to um, to remember sound as a part of the world that's so easily forgotten. And not only sound, but the, but the um, uh, ugly sounds. But there is, you know, sounds go extinct, uh, like anything else. And I remember, I just wanted to, uh, us to remember that R. Murray Schaefer, who worked at SFU in the yeah. 60s and 70s, had a soundscape project where he went around uh, taping all these soundscapes around Vancouver and elsewhere, um, huh? wherever he was, he went around the world. So the, he has amassed an archive of sounds that many of which I'm sure have changed or don't exist anymore. But um, again, it's it is that uh, place through that that goes so directly into us that can't. You know, you can't have any. I guess that's why they torture people at Guantanamo with Beastie Boys or whatever they play on loud. <laughs> that is, but, you know, but but because you can't, you know, 
you, you have no resistance to it. So I think it's part of the power and uh, the uh, um, uh, life of, of a rewilded poetry or a rewilded relationship to the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, any, yes, you've had your hand up yeah. a while. Well, I, 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 I guess I'm one of these uh, sharing stuff the academics to some degree, so I'll warn you at first. But I want to thank you really from the panel for bringing all of uh, this up. And I thought a lot too about, about these interrogating these questions of wildness. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what various people can think on the panel, um, like how much of, a, of the problem with the we, people that we have when utilizing these concepts like wildness, wilderness, nature, is due to this assumption that they denote some purity, mm -hmm. right? So versus, as David's talking about, ecology more as process or how or a set of relationships. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering how much is that? Is that is that do we do we go Timothy Morton's route and say, oh, we get rid of nature? That's the problem. Nature's the problem. <laughs> or 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 a route like I might suggest, or I'm wondering if others might um, that we get away from this idea that as a thing or a purity, a pure thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well. Um, I want to backtrack a little bit to this idea of civilization, maybe, because I think it's often opposed to wilderness. And I think everybody was, is or was civilized. Like, we have different cultures, right? And this idea that one is, is civilized and one isn't has been a real problem, right, in, in terms of how, how it's broken or prevented relationships from happening. And I think different cultures, as, as Steve was saying, have different relationships to place. So the sense of... Um, what was it, multi-generational, long-term inhabitation geared towards interdependency. Like, if we think about that as, as respecting what's out there and, and realizing that you have to use it and you, you may need to eat and all those kinds of things, but you also have a sense of giving back and respecting the balance that's out there versus just arrogantly using whatever and not replenishing it or not giving it space to renew. So for me, it's about that relationship to the other, if you want to think about nature or or place, I think place or land is, is help, more helpful for me in terms of, because nature is very loaded as a, as a Western construct. Um, not that I would get rid of it necessarily, but I, I think I'm sometimes troubled by the way we use it and the things that are embedded in it, right, that, that need to be unpacked. So a uh, relationship to place that's, that's, I think, grounded and uh, ecologically literate is, is, is what we're talking about, um, it, or trying to build, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah, and then, but I really appreciate the point, and especially the, the direct answer toward the idea of, of relation. Uh, and I think, yeah, I, I don't, I struggle a bit with Morton um, and some of his, his ways of approaching this because he's kind of one of those, I'm going to tear it all down and show you how, how crazy it all is kind of thinkers. But um, I think if we can get away from the idea of nature as a thing um, or a, a um, as, or as in terms of purity and get back to it as relation. That's what I was thinking about, the, the sitting here thinking when you're, you're seeing that is, is, and this is kind of where I'm haltingly trying to go in the, the sort of way I'm thinking about this right now, uh, is how do we think of ecology, how do we think of um, nature in terms of social relations? Like to, to, in, to, not, to not separate the social and the natural, but to put the social back into nature where it always was, because if we're gonna reproduce ourselves as societies, we ha are going to do that by interacting with, consuming, impacting um, the natural world around us. So how do we uh, uh, work holistically? And you know, I'm an aberrant reader of Wordsworth. <laughs> um, I'm writing a book right now called Reading Wordsworth in the Tar Sands. And, uh, but I think there's something fascinating in all of Wordsworth's, uh, he's held up as this, all oh, the romantic idea of nature is this ideal place you, you, you sail out into. For Wordsworth, nature was a social system. He lived in the Lake District, which was an area of, of common land, like, like uh, common farming. Uh, and all his early poetry is based on encountering like vagrants and displaced people in common lands. He's in the middle of a social system, which he, which that's what nature is for him. Because in England, even in words of the day, there's no nature in this purified sense. It's all been impacted by human beings. It's all being productively used one way or another. Um, so I think that's important to, to, to rethink our relationship to, to nature as a, 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 a coherent and totalized system we are a part of, and, and that's all about relations and process. Yeah. Uh, 
it keeps happening. Whenever the mic comes to me, I just don't have any more things that are smarter than Rita and Steve have to say to say. <laughs> but uh, but I, I guess I might just add that like sometimes when I think you know naming something is, is so powerful because then we can you know start to think about it, start to feel less alienated from whatever it is that we're considering. But I also think you know it, it's. Um, it, it can give us, uh, it can fool us very easily, you know, because we have the word ecosystem, then we might think, oh, we understand these things that are called ecosystems. I mean, I just recently learned about aerial rivers, which apparently even, you know, the U.S. kind of meteorological people, the NOA people, are just learning about themselves. So, it, it, like, there's all sorts of new weather phenomena that are going to emerge as well because of the shifting climate systems and et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's my thinking about it, is that it's just to not be misled by the fact that we've actually named something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fuzziness of the concepts. Do you want to say anything, or shall we? Uh, I think we probably have time for one more. Gee, so many hands. How do we pick? Uh, we'll go Art. I just wanted to build on that point that there's lady here raised about dichotomy and how we use technology responsibly. Um, most people in this room, I venture to say, are totally unaware of the fact that we are living in an electromagnetically saturated environment. <laughs> scientists tell us it is millions of times higher in exposure than humanity has ever had before. If you compare it with the natural background radiation that we evolved under over millions of years, all of our handheld devices and our wireless devices um, are all contributing to this. So it's not just do I get in a car and drive to a conference, it's how much am I using that infrastructure and how is that going to affect other living creatures, for example, like the bees like the bird's ability to navigate to where they need to go to breed and to survive. So I just am inviting us all to be conscious of that as well. And, and there have been forest die-offs as well that are traced, at least in part, to wireless radiation. Uh, that really is something that is very seldom, of course, it's a subject near and dear to my heart since my own current book project is on that, wireless radiation, but it is something that is not factored in very much, even to people who are at the forefront of ecological activism. Uh, it, it is a blind spot at this point in terms of looking at the environment, but really, when you think that, as you say, at least a billion times the levels of electromagnetic radiation are a billion times higher today than they were even a hundred years ago, well, nothing evolves. Human systems, ecological systems, do not evolve that rapidly to uh, bolster themselves against a billion-fold increase in something that actually is toxic. That is um, also what I think I was trying to talk about, about the violence of the surface, of surfaces, that this, you know, the, the um, replacement of the world by screens. We're all, like, totally addicted to this. There's something about them that draws us... Uh, um, and I hear about people putting on these glasses that will augment reality. Well, Try reading a book of poetry, okay? <laughs> I think this is a really, really essential, um, essential piece of the puzzle, as it were. That's not only a blind spot, but a profoundly, addic a, yeah. a profound addiction of our consciousness, yeah. and um, that uh, is could be the subject of a whole other conference, and probably is. Um, I, you know, we're pretty much at the end of our time. Do, we, do any of you have anything to say? Okay, I think what I'm going to do, since we're at 11 o'clock, we, I, I know we didn't get everybody's questions. Really glad to hear the questions and comments we did hear. Uh, we'll have, uh, what do we have now? Is it a 30 minute break? Somebody who knows the schedule? And then we have our next panel in here at 11.30. I would like to very much thank my panelists, Rita Wong, Stephen Collins, I just wanted to mention that all of you picked up packages that either at the beginning of the festival or now or whatever. There's an assessment form for all of the events right from Thursday on. 
So uh, if you can, take a, take a moment sometime today to fill that in and drop it off at the box at the greeter table. Thanks very much.